Um, if you guys can't hear me, that's usually because you're sitting too close and you can't make out what I'm saying. So usually my voice carries very, very well. But um, I appreciate Larry asking me to come here today. Um, it's kind of been open-ended because he, he said he had some producers here in the Valley that wanted to talk about livestock nutrition. So he put me in touch with a couple different individuals. Um, Dr. Crawford's in the room. We talked a little bit about what his vision was. We talked a little bit about what Larry's vision was. Talked with a couple other producers and came back here. So the title is Winter Nutrition and doing some ration balancing. And we're going to just talk about a few things. I'm not going to try to teach you any rocket science, but coming from my background, yes, I worked for Colorado State University. 45 years ago, if you were in that last room, 45 years ago, I started feeding my first 4-H club steer. Um, I was nine. And uh, my family was in Carville, Colorado. If anybody knows where Carville, Colorado is, it's a little dot on a map. And if you've been through, you've probably been lost. Okay? Because you have to be going to Carville or lost to get there. Um, it's very dry country, um, short grass, cow-calf operation, dry land farming. The only reason my grandfather settled there is it was cheap, and I think that's where the wheel fell off the wagon. And they just stopped, and they were done. So um, I've spent some time as a high school ag teacher. I've spent 17 and a half years now in extension in Wyoming and Colorado. Um, I retired. I went back to the family ranch. I still have, after the drought, I still am proud to say I have at least 50 cows left, okay? Um, just a little bit in 2000, 2001 in that dry spell. Um, we sent a lot of cows out of the country, brought them back. In 2012 and 13, we learned our lesson. And in the spring of 2012, we calved 650 cows on the ranch. In 2013, we calved 80 that we had left. And we're back, my dad's going to be 82 this year, and he's home calving 280 cows from 50 of them are mine. So I get to come talk, dad does all the work. But uh, that, that's kind of where we come from there. So I do represent CSU and we are equal opportunity. So if anybody wants to disagree with me, I'm very much open to it today. Okay, I actually want to turn this more into a discussion session that we have and questions that you may have. We're going to do some very basic stuff, but the most important thing I think we need to stop and realize, <clears throat> and you probably all know these, nutrition levels, they change as we go throughout the cycle with the stage and age of the animal, with stage of production, the time of year. The big one that we have right now is this forage availability. Okay, you guys have been through just as much dry, and I was surprised that I didn't see more snow when I came out of the North Country coming down here. And then dealing with different environmental conditions. You know, the average cow, and I use the temperature of about 20 degrees. Okay, so anytime that cow's temperature falls, the ambient temperature in the air, whether that's wind chill or whatever, falls below 20 degrees, it's going to increase her energy needs 1% for every degree below 20 that we get. And that is if she's dry, okay? And when I say dry, that means her hair coat, not whether she's nursing a calf or not, or whether it's you. But we know that feed is a major cost of production, right? We have our land values, which I've always wanted to own a ranch and I'm still an extension. We have supplemental feeds, and I count that as hay, anything that's not grazed. And if you look at the Kansas data for their Farm and Ranch Management Association, the average, if you can see there, the difference between a high efficient producer and a low efficient producer in their marketing of those animals is only $52. So the difference in the price they're getting is $52. The difference in their input cost are $350 a cow. So the difference between a high and low producer is $400 or in that range. But most of that is on the input side. 
So if you want to become one of those benchmark high-level cow-calf producers or a sheep producer, it's going to be the input side where you have to figure out how to make the differences. So if we start talking about nutrition, I don't start anywhere but with water, okay? Because it's the most necessary and overlooked nutrient. And we have requirements for those cows. A mature cow that's non-stressed will take 8 to 16 gallons per head per day. And that's dependent on heat. A mature ewe that's non-stressed will take 1 to 4 gallons a head a day. Okay? And we need to talk about the quality. As you guys have talked, and um, Troy Bowder was out there, total dissolved solids need to be less than 2,500 parts per million. 500 less than 500 parts per million sulfates, less than one to 200 parts per million nitrates. And we've talked a lot about nitrates in my job this year, and a lot of that is people that haven't tested their water. So I would just like to see a show of hands. How many of you have a water test baseline on your stock wells? Yeah, that's what I thought. So my dad's the same way. I've been trying to get him to test the water in the stock wells for years. But we have had a lowering water table over the last three years. These numbers are going up in those stocking instances. And sometimes we're blaming those nitrate issues on feed when really we're starting to get a little bit more of those issues coming into our water. And if you need some other information, I'll make these slides available to Larry and let him share them with the Ag Conference so that you can go back through this and take a look at it. Oh, I keep hitting the wrong button, Morgan. But we all know that profitable operations are going to have a high percent calf crop and lamb crop. A cow's pregnant 280 days a year while I use only 148 days. Gives us a little bit of difference. We have 80 days to breed that cow back so she breeds within a year. I'm not telling you anything you know, but that's a little bit varied for different sheep operations. Sheep operators have it a little bit easier at times when we talk about breeding. The nutritional level prior to birth and through the breeding season is critical. And I'm going to say that we are now linking quality grades of steers based to on in utero nutritional levels. So if we're looking at marbling and steer cattle, we can now base that back to some of the effects that were done in the last trimester of those cattle uh, while they're still inside mama. So if we think we can cheat them at any time, we're having there. And the theory of body reserves or make mama work, I believe in that. I run cows. She's got to work for me. She needs to be able to fluctuate a little bit throughout the year. We don't want her just overly fat. We don't want her just overly thin. We need to keep those cows in some kind of shape or those ewes in a shape that is appropriate for the time of the year they're in. So I want you guys to kind of think about this a little bit. This is a mature cow requirement for a 1,200 pound cow. Every research paper I read talks about a 1,000 pound cow. And we were talking about this and we're doing some research based on cull cows and body condition scores as they go to the market this year and I'm kind of interested to see what comes back. But if you look here, a 1,200 pound cow at 20 pounds of milk per day during peak lactation. And a 20 pound cow is about average, okay, for a beef cow to produce during the day. We kind of have those months since calving over here, okay, so this chart starts at the day she calves. And you can see her nutrient requirement. And the two most expensive ones that we tend to put in are energy and protein. That's our two highest necessary nutrients besides water is protein and TDN. I still use TDN. Some people use digestible energy. There's a formula down here. If you get something back on digestible energy to convert it to TDN, okay? But total digestive nutrients is what I still like to take because I'm a little bit old school. So my pointer's not working here quite so well. But as you can see in that red box up there, those first three months, that's the months that we're going to be trying to breed her back. Okay, she needs almost three pounds of crude protein in her diet a day. She needs to be closer to 58% or higher TDN in that diet. 
That gets hard to do, and I'll show you here in a minute. If she doesn't have some kind of body reserve there to work for you, that will be something that's there. And then we go into those three months where she's nursing the calf. Peak lactation in that beef cow is going to be somewhere, I'm going to say, around 50 to 70 days. So I like to use 60. Two months, she's going to hit peak lactation. It's going to start falling off. She doesn't require quite as much energy. We don't want to wait for 60 days to get her bred back because that gives us a 20-day window in there, which is two cycles to breed within a year of time. We can keep that nutritional requirement up in terms of TDN and crude protein. We can fix it there. What happens at month seven? We wean those calves, right? Her requirement goes to half, drops significantly in terms of energy, and that cow, and I call that my green light period, we're weaning that calf if we want to increase her body condition score. If we want to get her ready and prepped for the last trimester that she's going to be pregnant, if we're going to have her in good shape, we tend to think of that time. And what I find with most of my clients is that's a period of time where they're like, we're out on the worst feed we can get. We're out on the cheapest feed. And it may be the time of the year where they can make the most gain on an animal with some supplementation to get her in a body score where she's going to be more relevant to go. So after we wean, does anybody sort their cows based on body condition and feed the thinner cows a little bit more? Or put those fat cows out on the rough forage and maybe we keep those thinner coming three-year-olds back in? and keep them just going a little bit better so that we have them in shape so we get ready for that last trimester. Because when she starts that last trimester, these energy deals start to go back up because we are putting on pounds of calf. And she needs to gain somewhere between 100 to 140 pounds. That's body fluids, calf, all kinds of different things during that last trimester as she goes to pregnancy. So, I don't know what your cycle is here. This last trimester for me is January, February, and March in my operation. Is that a time when we usually try to get cows to gain 100 to 140 pounds very easily and very efficiently? What are you guys doing in January, February, and March here in the valley with your cows. Somebody, we're feeding them, right? We are feeding these cows. And that takes quite a bit of energy and hay. And then once we get them fed, show of hands just quickly, who in here's calves in February? No, no, no holds, okay? Who in here calves in March? Who in here calves in April? Who in here calves in May? Any June calvers here? Because probably they've got to get up and be out on pasture because we have farming to do, right? Okay? The whole reason that my dad starts calving in February is because he's got a farm, which doesn't make any sense to me as a livestock man. Okay? I, I haven't figured that out. So I breed my cows to start calving March 18th. He breeds his to start calving February 15th. Now I'm going to give my dad some heck here because he's my worst critic. Okay? Yes. I don't have a handout of this, but I will make it available for you. I'll make the whole slide deck available for Larry. And if you guys want to, I'll uh, sign it up and you guys can put it in. I'll email it to you directly. Okay? But as we go through this, <coughs> I think you'll take that and, and take a look at it. But what I want to tell you is right after weaning is the best time to make some gain in those cows. During summer, they're on grass, right? Because if you guys are calving, majority of you guys are calving in March. This is the summer months where we have some grass. I'm going to say in a normal year, okay? And then in the fall, we have some time where we can make haste on those cows. But most of us are more worried about taking care of the wean calves, are more worried about taking care of some of the other things. 
that we need to be getting done as far as putting hay up and getting it ready so that we can feed them. When maybe we should be feeding a little bit of that hay earlier, depending on what it is, to increase that body score before we get to it. I am not about feeding hay. The less hay we can feed them, I think the better we are, particularly Somebody throw me out a number of what hay prices are here in the valley. What is a meadow hay worth a ton? Nobody wants to throw it out because you're afraid somebody's going to ask to buy it from you for that. Okay? So I was at a ranching for profit on Monday, and we were using a number in eastern Colorado of $300 a ton. Okay? I hear of coming out of Sterling, Colorado, $9,000 loads of hay delivered to Texas right now. Okay, that's what it's costing them to get it to Texas for a load of hay. I don't know what that figures out a ton, depending on what they carry, but hay's, hay's expensive. Feed is a third of the cost of your direct cost of your beef production unit, okay? So I've spent enough time on this, but you guys get the idea. Sheep, we're a little bit different. Okay, for those of you guys that don't like sheep, here we start lambing. Some of you are doing that right now. If you want to be profitable, I told them to lamb in May. But if you're raising show lambs like I did, you're, you're lambing in January, okay? She's dropping in weight. She's dropped 30 pounds just by lambing. She's going to drop down another 10, 12 pounds as we get to here. And then we're going to wean those lambs out there at four months. Show lambs, we'll probably take them off a little earlier than that. Commercial ones, depending on when they come back from wherever you're going, we'll wean those. She's dry. And she's usually dry during a time of year where most native forages will take care of her, okay? Then, at breeding time, before breeding time, we're going to flush her, okay? A positive energy effect, a positive energy balance, flushing, Increases the number of twins. I don't like triplets, but I'm going to say triplets. Okay? As they come up, we like that flushing effect to get them bred so that we can increase that. And then as you get out here into, if you're lambing in January in this area, or if you're lambing in April and May, this is March, you're going to try to put a lot of weight back on her as she starts developing that fetus in the last 45 days, or multiple fetuses in the last 45 days. The thing I think that's important here, a third of a pound, late gestation's fourth, and during lactation or protein level doubles, okay? Takes a lot of protein to put some milk in there. Also, you can see here, as you get from early to late, to lactation, her energy level increases significantly. The other thing I want to tell you, they have an advantage on you guys because they're not nursing when they're trying to breed. The other thing I will say is in your replacement heifers, there's a lot of research being done out in Nebraska that is not so much that what or how good a shape our replacement heifers are in, but what the energy effect is that they're in going into breeding season. So I'm gonna put that maybe in a little plain English that I learned from my practicality. So when we try to AI heifers, we tried to put them in a lot. We tried to synchronize them. We got them fat. We AI them. When you AI a heifer, you're supposed to holler immediately or you have to wait a few days so that you can maintain that pregnancy. Well, we haul her out of a lot where we're feeding her exact balance, diet ration. We put her out on range. What's the first thing that happens to her nutritional level early on? It drops, right? Okay. I did much better breeding heifers if I get them out on range. I can supplement them a little bit there and turn that energy curve back up and then synchronize them and breed them on range, maintain that energy level for about 14 days, and by that time, the native range has increased. Had less to do, I'm breeding a higher percent conception 
of heifers at a lower body weight than I was before. And it had nothing to do with the fact that I had it wrong. It had to do with the fact that I just had them in the wrong projection when I'm trying to get that cow to settle. That's why it's much easier to breed cows when we have green grass, green forages that are covering all their nutritional needs than it is when we're trying to breed back a cow that's calved in February at the first of May when it hasn't rained in our country, okay? And we see these cow herds get strung out from doing that. So if you take nothing else away, 30 days prior to breeding, we need to be feeding them a little better feed. We need to be going up. Cows, you're going to be in lactation. Sheep, you're going to be doing the same thing. So let's look at this. This is what I would get back. And I'm going to ask how many of you guys get hay tests done? How many of you guys raise hay? Yes. Yeah, so if you're raising hay, you're probably getting a hay test done, right? Because you got to sell it to somebody. So you guys, this is not new to you, right? Okay. So if we're looking at this and we're going through, we're talking about this was third cutting. Okay. Dry matter basis is what I'm going to use to calculate those rations on. 23%. This come out of Lahara. Okay, and I'm going to use all those because I got a set from Larry out of Lahara. So if we're looking at that, we're looking at TDN of 61%. That will more than meet a cow's energy needs. But how many pounds does a 1,200-pound cow need to eat to meet it? An awful lot. How many pounds will a 1,200 cow, how many pounds do you feed your 1,200-pound cows? 24, 25, okay. Will 25 pounds of that meet her needs? And more, maybe. I have a hard time balancing any ration when they're at peak lactation that will meet their needs. Even with feeding them straight third cutting alfalfa hay. Okay. You look at this compared to the second cutting, which I found interesting. In Lahara, the second cutting was a lot higher in crude protein and lower in energy. Okay. Probably wasn't quite as digestible as the third cutting was, just based on stems and leaves. Okay. That kind of fits into that range yet. This was triticale, came out of Lahara. It's only 10% crude protein, okay? But it was 60% TDN, okay? So with that, that will meet her needs. We're just not figuring her protein and not meeting her protein with that as we come through, okay? And I'm gonna look down here, and we'll get to this a little later, concerning calcium and phosphorus. Meadow hay. I found that your meadow hay is highly digestible, okay? Had more energy, okay? We were talking about earlier, you know, we see some cows that get some energy needs, but the crude protein, this is not unusual for a meadow hay to be somewhere in that 7 to 9% crude protein, okay? If you go through there. Takes 34.9 pounds to meet her crude protein needs. Will a 1,200 pound cow eat 34 pounds of dry matter? Probably not. That's going to be very hard for her to do. Okay? And we always want to check our calcium and phosphorus ratio. Those are the two minerals that I think everybody is aware of. And I'll show you here in a minute how that works as we go forward. Okay? So, Juggling through this and coming through these that we saw here, the last thing I want to talk about, because we did talk about triticale, is nitrates, okay? As we get into this, our nitrate levels here, we've tested a lot of feeds this year. And at one time, Ward Labs in Nebraska said that 40% of their tests that they were running for nitrates were testing out of Colorado as being at a unsafe level, okay? A lot of those come from southeast Colorado, 
where they're feeding a lot more sorghum and triticale and things like that. But if we look at that, you're going to get nitrate, nitrate, nitrogen, and potassium nitrate. If you guys get a nitrate test back, I don't want you to just look at the numbers in that middle yellow column, okay? I've had too many people this year that get a flyer that says nitrate level of 5,000 was safe, okay? That's kind of the borderline. Their test was this, they were using this number. That's almost five times higher than a toxic level. That's double that number and aborted about 20 to 30 calves. Okay, so if you take nothing else away, I want you to know the difference between nitrate and nitrogen and nitrate when it comes back on a test, okay? Ward Labs reports theirs back as nitrate and nitrogen. I don't know which laboratory you use, but it is very difficult when you look at that. And even though it said unsafe on their paper or toxic, they were like, well, I heard 5,000 was the safe number. Make sure you're dealing with the correct number. So we're going to jump quick. Vitamins and minerals was something that they else wanted me to talk about. We talked about calcium and phosphorus. Vitamins, fat-soluble ones. They're the ones that when we get these dry years and dry forages tend to go away, A, D, E, and K. A goes away very fast. E does not go away as fast as we go there. These can be stored by the animal. But if they utilize them up in the spring and we have a very dry summer and we don't get green feeds, we don't replenish vitamin A. We get lower deals. And then we have water-soluble ones. But the most important thing, I think, with vitamins is when we're talking about immunity. The ability of that cow's reproductive system to be immune to things. The ability of the calves, when it hits the ground, to be immune to things. To have a correct vitamin and mineral supplementation in them is important. How many of you guys have seen the mineral wheel? Yeah, everybody. The ones in yellow are our macro minerals. The ones in red are our micro minerals. For some reason, they left chlorine off this one. So salt, you've got sodium, but they don't have chloride on there. Okay? But uh, the thing I'd like you to notice is there's six, two, three, four, five, six mm, copper. We get over here to calcium, there's seven coming out of there, six, seven. Phosphorus, there's seven or eight coming out of there. If you're not paying attention to your calcium and phosphorus, you're probably having trouble with other minerals. The other thing I want you to take away, if you're buying a mineral, is it an oxide? Is it iron oxide, whatever mineral you're using, is it a sulfate or is it chelated? Chelated is something that has, is an inorganic mineral that's got a protein attached to it so that it's more digestible. Not every mineral needs a chelate, so be careful and do, do your research as we go through here. They have some good information at this Mississippi State website, and I'll share that again on the slide. I think there is a fine line between how many dollars you lose in performance and how many dollars in excess waste you can get in your mineral program. How many of you guys, and I was talking with Dr. Crawford at lunch, how many of you guys have ever done a liver biopsy on a cow? <laughs> I see Morgan has, <laughs> okay. If you've ever done a liver biopsy to see what minerals they're needing, or as Dr. Crawford so eloquently suggested, how many of you guys process your own beef? send a beef in to be slaughtered, have it processed. How many of you ask for the liver back? How many of you would send a piece of that liver in if they could get that fresh liver from the packing plant and get you an idea of what your mineral program might have been? Okay? What may be needed? I tend to think of it if I've got some cold cows that I've got to feed for a while, that's a good target for an actual live liver biopsy. I can see what I'm going to get rid of particularly in my older cows, because I think they're probably lower there, okay? So there's some different things. Yes, ma'am. Correct. 
but it's one you've raised. So there should be some, she will probably have balanced out some of that, correct? If you were taking something that's grass fed off the place or something that happened there, that would be truer. And as like Dr. Crawford pointed out, I like to do cull cows, but that doesn't tell you what your herd is because there's a reason you're culling those. And you may identify that you have a problem in reproduction. If I'm sampling my open ones and I find that I'm low in zinc or I'm low in copper and in this area, you're low in copper. There's no doubt about it, okay? So if you have something like that, it may find an excess there. Um, we were talking about some instances where cobalt as a trace mineral is an, is an issue. Um, you know, and all of those, not only in the cow, but also in your bulls, affect reproductivity, okay? And most of us like to put the mineral out when we think we need it. If you think you need to be putting mineral out, you probably should be putting it out 30 days ahead of that. Or in a bull's case, 60 days ahead of that, because it takes 60 days for that bull to produce a sperm that's gonna be viable before he can breed a cow. So if there's something in the spermatogenesis process that's not working correctly, it takes 60 days to fix that before we've got viable cells to breed a cow. So if we're seeing and we're fertility testing our bulls and we're getting those marginal deals, we have a mineral vitamin imbalance someplace, we can boost that a little bit. Um, we were talking and I don't necessarily get into topics, but I'm gonna use it because it's my instance. My yearling bulls, I've been feeding them the same way. And as I get those ready to be marketed, those bulls, I would have a tough time passing a fertility test at 11 months of age. I added some multi-men to that, copper, zinc. And last year, first time through every bull passed. I'm giving it 30 or 40 days before I test them, okay? I'm trying to give it 60 days because I know it takes 60 days there. So when I go through and I tattoo my Angus bulls and put some changes in, I give them a shot of multi-man. Yes? Correct. Well, if you're already giving it, because I don't necessarily give it right at weaning, okay? I don't necessarily give it in October. I usually wait till January or February just before I'm fertility testing those bulls at the end of March, okay? I'm guessing you're doing very good. My question to you is, your wallet squeal once in a while because that's what I, I guess that's what I'm getting to I mean I want you guys to be as productive as you can are you having any problems in bull fertility well I'm not going to tell you to change because I think a fertile bull this year is going to be worth a lot that's my question mine I was staggering through there okay and when I say I was having troubles I wanted 90 to 95% to pass the first time. Because when you're selling yearling bulls, I don't know what age you're selling. When you're selling yearling bulls, everybody's bull sales in February. I was calving in March. I was trying to sell a 11 month old bull that was passing fertility. That's hard to do. Particularly as we have increased cattle size because as we have increased cattle size and everybody talks, I'm gonna get off on a soapbox here. As we talk about performance, okay, well, yeah, we're going to talk cattle size, okay? Because all of you guys, we talked about a thousand pound cow, okay? I don't see her. I worked in the sale ring when I went into retirement back in 2005 to 2010. I worked in the sale ring at Winter Livestock in Lahana. I don't see them coming through. Okay, if she weighs a thousand pounds, 
it's because she might have hardware. She may have brisket. Dr. Holt's saying that. Or she's a yearling. When my dad started the first set of heifers, he was calving 700 pound bred heifers. They were 700 pounds of calving. He's trying to breed them at 750 pounds. Okay? You know, it's, it's a different world than it was 40, 50 years ago. Okay? Yes. So, maybe you can help me with this, Dr. Crawford. Where do you send a liver to get tested, and what's the cost to do it? CSU, as we were talking about, sends all theirs to Texas A&M. Okay? I work for CSU. I don't want to say the bypass this, but it may be just as easy to contact Texas A&M University and send it directly to them and see exactly how they want it packaged. Okay? I kind of like to send mine through the company that pays me. Okay? You're not you're not entitled to that. So it doesn't. No. You, you I mean it you can you can almost send a straw. It is. It it it'll cost you a little bit. Well, hundred dollars to do some liver biopsies. Yep. It doesn't take long to spend $100 on bags of mineral or a bottle of Multimin. Because I don't, I don't know what it is right now. I was going to say, it, it, it's pretty expensive, that little bottle of Multimin. We've got we've to do this more efficiently. Um, I'm going to run through these real quick. Um, as you guys know, there's a fine line as we drop in mineral status. As mineral status decreases, we see more sick cows. We see growth and fertility problems. We get to clinical signs. And if you see a sign where you're getting bad hair or we have issues, it's too late. Okay? First thing I want to look at, do I have more sick cows? Do I have more open cows? Do I need to be taking a look at my deal? Okay? So I'm going to look at those things as we go through. A couple other problems that they said you had here. Milk fever. Okay? hypocalcemia, the inability to absorb and mobilize calcium. Sometimes it's not that they don't have enough calcium, they just can't absorb it fast enough. We usually raise the calcium and phosphorus in the diet because we want to keep those in that two to one ratio, okay? We want to balance that. Too high of calcium in the diet is a problem. If we get way out of balance, then we don't have enough phosphorus to work with that calcium to get it metabolized and adequate vitamin D, you may be getting this and it may not be a calcium problem because you're feeding a feed that's high there. You said you were seeing this more on cows that are on drier forages here, which I'm guessing is lower in calcium in this area. We tend to see it when we go to the very green pastures and we've changed from a very dry to a green and they can't absorb all that and we get a problem when we go forward because a lot of our guys like to go to rye pasture or something like that. White muscle disease in lambs. You guys are low selenium, right? In this area. Selenium and vitamin E. So if you're feeding a forage and you're low in selenium and your dried up forage doesn't have enough vitamin E in it, there's two types. There's a cardiac deal where you get these weak lambs that just can't get up and get going, okay? And then you've got a skeletal one where they become rigid and um, stiff almost. Most of the time, if you're supplementing some of that, you may not want to supplement it free choice. Okay, you may want to put it into something so you're getting the right amount into a U in a pellet or something, particularly if you're dealing with selenium. There's the ability to be injectable. I'm not sure injectable selenium is an option, particularly if you've got a thousand U's that you're gonna vaccinate. And just remember that it's required by goats at a higher level. So if any of you guys are doing the goat thing, um, Selenium in goats is required at a little bit higher level. I don't know if any of you guys have polio issues in cattle or lambs, okay? I run into it a lot. It's vitamin D, B1, thiamine. It's a thiamine deficiency. Can be caused by too much concentrate in relation to roughage. We find it in kosher, grazing kosher, where we turn those lambs out on something that's a little green. Kosha actually produces a thymase that blocks the utilization of thymine, 
causes us polio and in high sulfur diets. So if you're using sulfate minerals sometimes, and then you're supplementing with sulfur, and then you're having something else go wrong, there's so many things with vitamins and minerals. This is correctable and avoidable. That lamb was up in less than 12 hours at Michigan State University. They give him a shot, IV of thymin, and he was back up and went on, and they said in the paper that it's now four-year-old you. She's telling me time's up. Okay, I don't want to make you late for your last one. Urinary calculi, if you guys are raising goats or sheep, big issue. Make sure your calcium and phosphorus ratio is correct. Add some ammonium chloride if you're adding something to the ration in a pelleted form to get to those. You guys have a lot of molybdenum, and it ties up copper, and that's part of the reason you guys are low in copper in this area. Calcium and magnesium levels. Sometimes if you're having troubles with calcium, it's your magnesium that's out of whack and not necessarily your calcium. So if you go to a high mag mineral, it may help you in some of those situations. We've talked some about zinc, iron, copper, and cobalt. Um, there's all kinds of ways. We've talked about the injectables. We've talked about free choice. We've talked about drenching or injecting boluses, copper boluses or something in there. It takes time. A lot of times we want to mix them with salt because if you just set some of those hard minerals out there, they're not going to eat them. They need some, something to help get that into their system. And you need to supplement before you change the diet. Biggest problem I have, I'm moving pasture. Oh, I was out of supplement over here. I need to put supplement in. I forgot to do it over here. I'm going to put some in today. You're doubling up some issues, okay? Before you... 30 days before you move anything, if you don't take anything away, make sure that your mineral supplementation is order in order for the next thing that you're going to, okay? With that, I always like to show my daughter and her favorite little bull calf. And any questions? I think we're out of time.